Well, my wife kicked off a series last weekend called Running with the Giants, and she did a great job doing that. This is going to be our summer series, and really it comes from a book by John Maxwell entitled The Same Thing, and it's really with the thought that as we run the race that God has called us to run, what if we could run a lap with one of the heroes from the Old Testament, and if we could, what would they tell us? And today I want us to imagine that we're getting to run a lap with David. David, probably more than anyone else in the Old Testament, would have been someone that I would have loved to run a lap with, someone to talk to. I relate with David because what you find with David was he struggled. He struggled in his humanity, and it's something that I relate with because we all struggle in our life. And on this Father's Day, I think something to recognize that although David was a great warrior, he failed in areas. He failed as a father. He failed in family. He failed even in being a king. He failed in being a husband. But even though he had failures in his life, he was still someone who was a man after God's own heart. And it's a reminder to us that we don't have to be perfect in order to be a man or a woman after God's own heart. And as we run the race, again, we have our thinking caps on. And just imagining David as he approaches us in his colorful robes, a jeweled sword, a crown upon his head. This great warrior, he would have been someone powerful, relaxed, but yet poised for action at any time. What would the greatest king of Israel say to us? As we look through the scriptures and we look at his life, the greatest king, what would he say to us? Would he perhaps maybe talk to us about the battles he led? The way that he expanded Israel's territory? How he felt when he wrote the Psalms, these Psalms that have given so many of us comfort? in our life, perhaps the loneliness he felt while in exile from King Saul. And as David would get closer to us, I think one of the things you'll see in his eyes is that he's a man that's experienced pain, grief, death, and sorrow, and yet not bitter in his life. And as David approached, this is what I think that we'd see, what he'd say, and what we could learn from the life of David today. And it's this, you can overcome the limitations others put on you. You can overcome the limitations that others put on you. You know, you may not think of limitations when you look at the life of David. And the reason is because we oftentimes, as we read the Bible, we see the stories from the end to the beginning. We understand what God was doing. And at the end, you see a great warrior, the greatest of kings. But when you look at the story from the beginning of his life, you see a very different story. You know, as a young man, there wasn't any resemblance of a warrior or even a king for that matter. He wasn't affirmed by those around him. You could say that his greatest battles in his early years wasn't against the lion or the bear, while he protected his father's sheep. But his greatest battles were through the people that constantly tried to put obstacles and limitations around him. You know, David's father didn't think that he had king potential. One of the greatest kings, or the greatest king of Israel, his father didn't think he had king potential. And maybe you're someone here today who's experienced the pain of having a parent not believe in you, not think that you could accomplish much. David knew that pain. David's father, Jesse. Imagine the excitement that Jesse felt when he found out the prophet was coming to his house to anoint one of his next sons to be king. I could imagine that he probably talked to his wife about it. He's probably thinking of all the characteristics in all of his boys and why maybe each boy might be chosen to be the next king. And he's thinking about it, wondering who will God choose. And what you find in the story is that when Samuel the prophet arrived, Jesse lined up every son for the prophet to look for, look to, except David. David wasn't even invited to the party. 
He wasn't even invited to watch one of his brothers be anointed king. His father didn't even think David had a chance to be king. They didn't even bother to bring David in. You know, Samuel even thought the same way. In 1 Samuel 16, 6, it says, When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, Surely this is the Lord's anointed. He thought he looked like a king. Well, you know, the first story about Saul, Saul looked like a king. He was the most handsome and tallest man in the land. He looked like a king and he failed. God was done with that experiment. It wasn't about what people look like anymore. The Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You know, God wanted David. He wanted the man with the right heart. Isn't it assuring to know today that God values us for who we truly are, even if our family doesn't? He sees your potential today. You know, I have a a friend that I golfed with a couple of times, and he's a great guy, and I like this guy. He makes me laugh because every time, if I hit a good shot, I'll hit a good shot, and he'll always be like, I see you. I see you. I see you. You know, I think that's how God is with us. I see you. I see you. I don't care what anybody else says. I see you. I don't care about what's happened in your past or or the limitations that people might place on you. I see you. Today, God sees us today. It wasn't only David's father, but even David's brothers didn't think that he had warrior potential. One of the greatest warriors of Israel, his brothers, couldn't see it. There was war between Israel and the Philistines, and they were set apart on the opposite sides of a valley. Goliath, the giant, would come out every morning and every night, and he would taunt the armies of Israel. Send a man to fight me. We'll decide it right here. And the armies of Israel were paralyzed with fear. They couldn't face the giant. Well, Jesse sends David to take some supplies, some food to his brothers there on the battleground. And when David arrived, it just so happened that Goliath had come out to once again taunt the armies of Israel. And David heard Goliath. He saw Goliath out there, and he expressed interest in fighting the giant. Well, David's brothers When they heard about this, they lashed out at him. They were angry that he would even think that. 1 Samuel 17, 28 says, When David's oldest brother Eliab heard David talking to the men, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyway, he demanded. What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? What was he doing? He was putting limitations on him. What about those few sheep? You're just a shepherd. What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and deceit. You just want to see the battle. David was probably thinking, what battle? Nothing was going on. You know, his brothers saw him nothing more than just a delivery boy. You could say the original Uber Eats. That was David right there. What, what else do you want? What, what else are you, just, just drop off the food and get back to the sheep. But what he really was, was he was a man with a mission that God had given to him. His brothers didn't see it. King Saul didn't think that he had champion potential. When King Saul heard that there was someone to fight Goliath, he immediately sent for them. Of all the army, no one wanted to fight. All of a sudden, he hears somebody wants to fight Goliath. He said, bring him to me. He was probably expecting a grizzled veteran warrior to walk in. But who comes in? It's David the shepherd. A young boy comes walking in, and he's probably sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, Goliath is nine feet 
nine inches tall. What is this boy going to do? And David walks in and he basically says, don't worry about it, king. I'll take care of Goliath for you. You know, it's a reminder to us that you need to remember who God says you are, even when others don't know it, even, even when others don't believe it. 1 Samuel 17, don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and win. You're only a boy. He's been a man of war since his youth. You know, Saul didn't see a champion. He didn't think this boy was up to the task. He tried to get him at least to wear his armor, but the armor wouldn't even fit a boy like David. David took it off, and he went to face the giant as he was. And you know, it doesn't end there. There's one more person who couldn't see the potential in David, and it was Goliath. Goliath Goliath didn't think that David even had equal opponent potential. Jesse doubted him. His brothers doubted him. King Saul doubted him. And even Goliath doubted him. When David went out, what did Goliath say? He said, am I a dog that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. He said, come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals. Goliath despised him, and Goliath was insulted that they sent a boy to fight the warrior. He didn't even see David worthy of a proper burial, and with those words, he attacked David. You know, you can easily determine the caliber of a person by the amount of opposition it takes to discourage him or her. David faced great opposition. He was constantly reminded that he had no potential. But yet, he was able to go beyond his family. Relational limitations. He was able to go beyond the King Saul's. That's the leadership limitations. And he was able to go beyond Goliath. Our skill limitations. He threw off all limitations, trusting in God, and he killed the giant. He killed the giant. And you know, as we run the race, if David were to run one lap alongside of us, let me give you three things that he could tell us from what we know about his life. Number one is this. Limitations don't limit us unless we let them. They don't limit us unless we let them. You know, when I was around five years old, uh, my my parents and my my grandparents especially, they take us swimming often. They're on Oahu at Haunama Bay. I don't know if you guys have ever been there. It's just beautiful there. And and we'd we'd go and we'd snorkel and we'd swim. And I remember, I still remember this as a young kid, I learned how to snorkel, and learning how to snorkel is just incredible, right? You just got this incredible independence. You're in the water snorkeling, seeing all this fish. You could even feed the fish, and it was just so awesome there. But when I was a little kid, I remember I was okay snorkeling in water that was around five feet deep. Five feet deep, I was okay. I was probably about, you know, three and a half feet, four feet tall, But in five-foot water, I was okay. But when the water would get deeper, you get some of those areas where it would drop to maybe 10, 15 feet deep. I'd be terrified to swim. It's like you stop. Whoa, 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 whoa. I can't go there. I can't go there. And one day, as a little kid, I had an epiphany. You guys ever have epiphanies? Some of you don't even know what that word means. (laughs) Just keep looking straight ahead. Nobody would know. Just nod once in a while. I had an epiphany. I I began to realize I could drown just as easily in five feet of water as I would drown in 15 feet of water. Because I can't reach in five feet of water anyway. And I remember thinking to myself, what am I being afraid for? And I was a chubby kid, so I could float. All I had to do 
was keep afloat. Whether the water was 15 feet, 20 feet, or 100 feet, it's the same thing. And as soon as I realized that, something in my mind clicked, the limitations was removed, and I began to snor snorkel all over the bay. It was the same thing. You see, the limitation wasn't about how deep the water was. It was what I believed in my mind. And you know, the limitations will only limit us from doing what we want to do if we let them. If we let them. And I say this, as a child of God, I don't think there's any excuse why we can't do what we set out in our heart to do. The dream that God has given to us, there's no excuse. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough education. I don't have enough experience. So what? Don't limit yourself. David's family thought he was, had no potential, but David realized at a young age that he had God potential in his life. I don't want to tell you, every single one of you today, you have God potential in your life. Amen? When you give your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the anointing that comes into our life, the same way David was anointed king, let me tell you, there's an anointing in our life today that we... we that we have that we can use to break free from the limitations of things that want to hold us back. I think about the story of Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey was born to a teenage single mother in Mississippi. And when you think about that time, it wasn't just about being poor, but the racial tensions and all of these things that were happening in, in that time. And as she was born, she was in a house that didn't have running water or electricity growing up. And she could have easily limited herself. But you know, she didn't let those things hold her back. She worked hard. She believed. She put her mind to it. And you know, when you look at her life now, She's worth over $2.5 billion. And it just makes me think, what's our excuse? What's our excuse? She didn't start off. In fact, many of us have started off easier than she did. But we just get comfortable. You know, comfort can be a limitation in our life also. I just had that conversation with a friend last week who's had a dream in his heart for many years and I just basically said, hey, you know, good is the greatest enemy of great. Good is the enemy of great because we can get stuck at good and not want to leave good and achieve what's great in our life. And it's been burning in my heart. I've said this over the last couple of weeks. It's free to dream, so dream big. I want us to be a church full of dreams Full of dreams, resurrecting the dreams again in our life, dreaming and believing because we serve a big God who can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask and we can think. The second thing David would tell us is this, don't try to be someone else when others impose limitations on you. Saul tried to put his armor on David to face Goliath. Saul wanted David to attack the problem the same way he would. You know that God didn't want a substitute Saul. He wanted a David. And you know God wants you today. You're not going to be held accountable for the gifts, the abilities, and the responsibilities that God never gave you. But you will be held accountable for what God has given you today. And I want to encourage you to stop trying to be like somebody else. Be who God made you to be. Grow in that. Mature in that. Become a better you today. And fulfill the call that God has given you. Don't be limited by being, oh, I, I'm, I can't do it. I'm not like them. I can't do it. I, I, I can't sing like they can. I, I can't... Uh, invest money like they can. I can't play the instrument like they can. I, I can't, I can't uh, start a business like they can. Stop comparing yourself and be who God has called you to be. And here's the third thing that I believe King David would tell us, or he could tell us, is that when you rise above your limitations, you can help others do the same. You know when David faced Goliath, he thought only of killing 
the giant. I don't think David realized that his step of faith, what it would do for the armies of Israel. The armies of Israel were paralyzed with fear. They were terrified of moving forward. But when you read the story, when David killed Goliath, what happened? The moment the giant fell, the army of Israel rose. They rose in faith and in courage. The fear and the intimidation was replaced with aggressiveness. And the army rose and they conquered the Philistines. You know, it's a reminder to us that people follow the example of their leader. As David rose, so did the people. And can I encourage you dads on this Father's Day? I want to encourage you men. I, I'm, I guess I would be what society would consider is old-fashioned now in my thinking but I still believe God created a man and a woman. That there's not multiple genders out there. God created a man and a woman and God has called men to lead. God has called you fathers to lead your homes, to lead your families. And I know at times there are women that need to lead because the dad is checked out or they're not a part of the story. But I want to tell you, if you're still married and, and dads, your wife is the leader, take the role that God has placed you in and lead. Because as you rise, so will your family. Your family will rise. You know, as fathers, we don't send our kids to church. We bring them to church. Let your kids see you love God. Let your kids see you love your wife. Let your kids see you serve in church. Let your kids see you worship in church. Let your kids see you engage in the message. Let your kids see you give in the offering. Let your kids see you be kind and love other people. As you rise, your family will follow in Jesus Name. Be that man. Man up. Register for the conference. Come out. Be encouraged. When you rise, you help others do the same. Men, when you rise, you help others do the same. Women, moms, ladies, when you rise, you help others. Do the same. It's amazing. I think it's just faith. Faith is contagious. Vision is contagious. Fear is contagious. Doubt is contagious. What do you want to catch today? That was kind of our joke during COVID, right? But it's like, I just, I just want to infect everybody with faith. Not COVID, but like faith sneeze. I hope I'm vision sneezing on you guys right now. Dream sneezing on you guys. And you guys catch it, and then you guys spread it. Come on, let, let, let's be that people today. David rose above his limitations. Let me tell you, you can rise above the limitations that people want to place on you.